program is an episode in the first paper on history. It deals with epigraphy, one of the major sources of ancient history. Human beings, no matter where they lived, have left their marks in various ways. On cave walls, rocks, and probably on other materials as well, but they have not survived the forces of nature. The earliest of the efforts of human communication that have survived are these pictures, animals, hunting scenes, and merely the imprint of the hand, perhaps to say that he or she lived here. These pictures were simplified from here to here and in the process they became what is now known as pictograms. Pictograms are abstractions of pictures. They can express more when combined with other pictograms. Thus, for example, a person walking with the sun on the left and then again with the sun on the right would mean that she has walked for a long time. Instead of the sun, if we put the moon, it can mean that she walked day and night. Now that concept can be expressed like this. This and this. When pictograms are further simplified, are made into abstract forms, they become what is known as cuneiforms. This was developed in the Sumerian culture about 3400 years before Christ. In the Egyptian culture, we know them as hieroglyphics that combined pictures and symbols. Hieroglyphs were written on papyrus. These became more efficient tools of expression than pictures or pictographs. Neither the cuneiforms nor the hieroglyphs were still the last stage of evolution of the tools of human expression. They had a basic problem. In the cuneiform, there were over a thousand unique alphabets. This became difficult for anyone to master it easily. Later, it was filtered down to 400, but this again was a large number. A new subset was developed from the cuneiform, now known as the Old Persian. Ugaritic was another subset of cuneiform. Then came a plethora of alphabets. people started writing on stones, metal, clay, wood and whatever surface they found suitable. These are called epigrams. Epigraphy is the discipline that deals in epigraphs. In this program, we shall deal with Indian epigraphy. Epigraphs or inscriptions denote any writing engraved on some object. In India, we find inscriptions on a variety of media clay, rock, metal, wood, palm leaves, and so on. They are found on pillars, seals, coins, walls, statue pedestals and so on. Depending on the media used, inscriptions are found all over India. These pillars from Barhat contain a number of inscriptions. One of the best
best known authorities in epigraphy, DC Sarkar had estimated that there would be around 90,000 inscriptions in various epigraphic sites in India. That was in the 1960s. Towards the close of the century, Richard Solomon had estimated the number to be much higher. The study of epigraphy started with the establishment of this institution, the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Kolkata in 1784. Now that we know about the definition and the whereabouts of epigraphy, let us look at the language. The scripts of ancient language are called paleographs and there is a whole science of this study known as paleography. Now let us remember that there is a difference between the language and the script. There may be many languages but not all may have their own script. For example, the script used here is Brahmi, one of the oldest scripts known to recorded history. But the language is Sanskrit. This is a copper plate from the Gupta period. Here, the copper plate has a crest with two deers and some inscriptions. It is actually a dharma chakra. Here, the language is Sanskrit and the script is Siddha Matrika. This copper plate is of rather recent origin, around the middle of the 12th century CE. The language here is Sanskrit and the script is Gauri. This is a terracotta seal. There is the Dharma Chakra and some writing. This is from Nalanda and it goes back to the 9th century CE. The language here is Sanskrit and the script is Siddha Matrika. So in order to understand the inscription, one has to have a command over two elements, the script and the language. In this case, Sanskrit and Siddha Matrika. James Princep was assistant assay master of the Calcutta Mint and a close associate of Sir William Jones. Jones was responsible for the setting up of the Asiatic Society. Princep made the breakthrough in deciphering an Ashokan edict in 1837. The edict was written in Brahmi script. But decoding the script is one thing and understanding the content was quite another task. The word Devanampiya did not make sense in Sanskrit. It was a local modification. It took another scholar, George Turner, who had known Pali, to affirm that Devanampiya meant beloved of the gods and it referred to Ashoka himself. Brahmi script appeared in India by about the 5th-4th century BC. A close examination of the script reveals striking similarities between Brahmi and Semitic languages such as Aramaic. It is well known that Aramaic is written from right to left and some scholars believe that Brahmi was also initially written in both directions, right to left and left to right. This is called Bustrophedon type of writing. They think that only at a late date, Brahmi came to be written exclusively from left to right. However, the controversy over the direction of writing in Brahmi is still current. We have to wait for the final answer to come. The theory that Brahmi may have originated from the Indus script is difficult to maintain, 
because there seems to be a huge gap of about 2500 years between the two. In the scripts, go back to 2900 BC and Brahmi goes back to only 300 BC, even if we take the earliest examples of the Ashokan edicts. However, it is equally interesting to see that both Brahmi and the Harappan scripts share certain systemic qualities that are striking, as DC Sarkar and A.H. Thani have noted. The decipherment of Brahmi was followed almost immediately by the decipherment of another script, Kharoshti. This time, James Princip and another scholar named C.L. Crotefend shared the credit equally although they worked separately. Kharoshti is written from right to left. There is a great deal of discussion on the origin of Kharoshti script. Some say that it is the work of a single inventor. Others say that it is an evolution from Aramic alphabet. Over a period of time, extensive modifications were made to denote certain sounds found in Indic languages. That is why it does not resemble Aramic. Here it is important to remember that script evolves as a requirement to express certain sounds. Therefore, sometimes a given script is modified by adding dashes or strokes to denote certain way of pronunciation. It is the phoneme that determines the shape of the script. Kharoshti probably was developed to suit the Gandhara society's way of speaking. A language that became almost the lingua franca of the Kushanas was the Gandhari. It was a modified, simplified Sanskrit written in Kharoshti. and development of language and script are interesting and challenging topics. Both Brahmi and Kharoshti seem to have emerged around the 5th, 4th century BC. From there, both developed. Most of Ashoka's edicts are written in Prakrit language using Brahmi script. Slowly, an epigraphical hybrid Sanskrit evolved. This eventually gave way to Sanskrit. This group of languages with their local variations is called MIA or Middle Indo-Aryan Languages. On the side of the script, Brahmi seems to have given way to Nagari and all the other later Indian scripts. So eventually, Prakrit, written in Brahmi, slowly gave way to Sanskrit, written in Nagari and its other local variants. And Gandhari, written in Kharoshti, seems to have died on its own after the 3rd century CE. Dr. Rajat Sanyal is a specialist in epigraphy and he comes often to this Parhat gallery of the Indian Museum. The inscriptions on these pillars are his subject of interest. Dr. Sanyal explains the donation of coins to cover the monastery. This is one of the finest medallions of, in the Bharut cluster of sculptures. This medallion depicts a whole story represented within a single composition it represents the story of a merchant called Anatha Pindaka who covered up a monastery called Jetavana with coins and the entire medallion shows different, its different segments shows different parts of that story. Most importantly, this medallion is supported with three inscriptions. The principal inscriptions, inscription is on the lower border of the medallion, then there are two other level inscriptions. 
The main purpose of this inscription is to describe the story depicted in the medallion. It reads the name of the monastery, the donor of it and his action. Jetavana Anatha Pediko that means Jetavana the monastery, Anatha Pindaka the merchant, Deity gave Kuti Santha Tena Keti. That means the merchant Anatha Pindaka has covered up the entire area of the monastery with coins. Then the two other level inscriptions that are on the upper and left margin of the medallion, this reads Gadha Kuti which is Sanskritized as Gandha Kuti. It is a segment of a monastery which has been translated as the perfumed hut. It is a part of the monastery and this is a fragmentary inscription which has five letters actually reads Kosa Kuti. It is highly fragmented but it can be reconstructed as Kosa Kuti, which should be the hut of the Kaushambas. That is quite a feat. To cover the entire monastery compound with coins will take a lot of coins and wealth. But what is amazing is that the entire story is depicted in one medallion. There are the bullocks and the tilted cart. This perhaps is the donor who looks on and these are the workers. This lady is perhaps the supplier of drinking water and at the back there are the onlookers, a typical Indian scenario. Since the scene is so vivid and elaborate, not much explanation is needed and hence the writing is so sparse. This is typical. Very often the communication is done in sculptures and therefore not much explanation is needed. Now in this composition we have two inscriptions and one medallion. The upper inscription is of 2nd century BC and it narrates the donation of a man who came from a certain place. It describes his native place and records his donation in the Bharhut cluster of sculptures. And in the second inscription, which is at least 100 years later than this upper one, if not more, it only describes the Buddha. Most interestingly, below it is the medallion that depicts the birth, the event of the birth of the Buddha the dream of his mother, Maya Dev. Inscriptions can be broadly categorized as royal, prashasti or royal panegyrics, administrative and personal. Royal edicts contain the statements of the ruling authorities. The most famous examples are the edicts of Ashoka. Prashasti or royal panegyrics contains praises of the king or an aristocrat for his valor, generosity or dedication. Administrative edicts called shasanas record almost exclusively the transfer of landed property in the rural areas. These are usually engraved on copper plates and form the largest gamut of epigraphic documents of pre-Islamic India. Personal inscriptions can be a memorial epigraph done in memory of a local hero or they can narrate an act of donation. Like most of the other inscribed pillars within the Bharat cluster, this pillar is also supported by a donative single line inscription in Brahmi letters and Prakrit language. The inscription actually reads Vedisa Chapa Devaya Revati Mita Bharayaya Pathama Thabhe Danam. It means a man and his wife along with their friend donated this first pillar on this pedestal. 
Epigraphs are mute witnesses of the past, holding numerous surprises for the one who has the audacity and the patience to unearth their secrets. A number of good books and periodicals are available on this subject.